Welcome to Lecture 2, The Historical Story of the Nazarenes. As in the first lecture, our outline will be these three questions. What, so what, and what if? I'm not sure what your experience with the Church of the Nazarene is, but for me, I grew up in the Church of the Nazarene, and if someone were to have asked me growing up what the Church of the Nazarene was about, my answer would be very simple. Nazarenes don't drink, dance, or go to the movies. That's it. I'm not sure if I heard it wrong, or if it was taught incorrectly, or if the actions of others spoke louder than the words, but these signs at the park are much closer to my experience of being Nazarene, and unfortunately they form my theology of what it meant to be holy, just obey all the rules. And it seems like I'm not the only one with this experience. So where did this idea from all the rules come from? As mentioned in the first lecture, the term Nazarene comes from the city that Jesus was from. Uh, Church of Nazarene comes from the United States, though, in, uh, in the early 1900s. Phineas Brzee was one of the founders of the Church of Nazarene, and he ministered where people were uprooted and dislocated. It was on the Iowa frontier, and then he moved to Los Angeles. His ministry was to needy people who were caught in poverty and confusion of the new cities with their economic and moral anarchy. This is one of my favorite quotes from him. My message is to poverty and despair. A church of the Nazarene has, divinely, has a divinely appointed mission. It is raised up to preach that we are to be sanctified wholly in this life and to fulfill that evidence of its possession, the preaching of the gospel to the poor. The mission was not taken up of our own accord, nor for our own convenience. We went into it at the call of the Lord. Here are some stats to show how this vision has grown over the years. Today, the Church of the Nazarene is home to more than 2.6 million members. It's over 30,000 local congregations, and it's in 163 world areas. 65% of Nazarenes are from outside of the United States. Church of Nazarene supports 51 colleges, universities, and seminaries on six continents and serves a richly diverse student body offering educational opportunities for more than 50,000 students worldwide. Eastern Nazarene College is the college on our region and it covers from Maine um, all the way down to Virginia. Church of Nazarene has 737 missionaries serving around the world in 212 languages and operates 33 medical clinics and hospitals. For some reason, I really like these type of pictures that overlap the present with what the place looked like back in the day. And so I'd like to use this type of picture as an illustration to look back at some of the early history of the Church of Nazarene and then to compare and contrast the essence of that to our expression of ministry in today's world. Words do not exist in isolation. They exist against a backdrop of experience and of thought. And the meaning of any word is conditioned by the background of the person who speaks it. A word conveys to those who hear it for the first time an impression quite different from the impression which it conveys to us. To do this, we're going to do a little time travel. So buckle up. We're going to start at the Mid-Atlantic District Office, getting our Back to the Future DeLorean with its flux capacitor, and we're going to meet up with Phineas in Los Angeles. In 1880, Los Angeles had 11,183 people. This is a picture of downtown L.A. in the days of Phineas Brzee. Then the railroads arrived. By 1890, we had 50,395 people coming in from all over the world. In 1892, oil was discovered in the city, and by 1923, we accounted for about a quarter of the world's petroleum output. In 
In 1900, our city grew to 1,002, 479 people, and by 1910, we had 319,198 people. By 1921, more than 80% of the world's film industry was concentrated in L.A. By 1920, we grew to 576,673 people. In 1932, we hosted the Olympics, and we had 1,238,048 people, a growth of over a million people in just 50 years. So that gives a little historical context in the city that the Nazarene ministry began, but what else was happening in the nation to give us some context as to why they did what they did in their churches? Prohibition banned alcohol nationally as a federal law, which was the 18th Amendment in the United States from 1920 to 1933. It was during Dr. Brzee's pastorate that the great prohibition movement began in California. Mafia emerged in the United States during this time frame. Among other things, they were associated with alcohol, gambling, dancing, and music. The Mafia opened speakeasies during this period of the United States history known as Prohibition. The speakeasies became the venues of the Jazz Age, an era when this popular music included current dance songs and show tunes. In this time frame, jazz had a reputation as being immoral, and many members of the older generation saw it as threatening the old values and culture and promoting the new decadent values of the Roaring Twenties. The term numbers refers to any illegal lottery that was run by organized crime before the advent of statewide lotteries and institutionalized gambling. Historically, the Nazarene Church was founded in order to help the poor, and in this time period, alcohol, gambling, etc., and their addictions were cited as things that kept people poor. So, some of the rules make sense uh, for the historical context of the day, but they don't always translate well into our world. So let's continue with a little more historical context to give a feel of what these early Nazarenes were up to. The feminist movement has its origins not in Marxist socialism or secular humanism or even theological liberalism, but the feminist movement started in the great holiness revivals of the last two centuries. It was the denominations produced by the mid-19th century holiness revivals that most consistently raised feminism to a central principle of church life. From the time Phineas Brzee organized the first church of the Nazarene in Los Angeles in 1895, women preachers and leaders played a vital role in the life of the young denomination. So that's a very quick historical peek at what was happening in the United States at the time of the birth of the Church of the Nazarene. So in today's world, some of these stances on drinking and dancing and movies and the lottery, they seem archaic, but in the early 1900s, these were radical stances, and they led to constitutional amendments around the sale of alcohol and women getting a right to vote. So what were early Nazarenes? We were radical. Okay, so that's what we were back then. So what? What's that have to do with us today? At this particular church, every Sunday morning, prior to the worship service, a group of people gathered in the middle of the sanctuary to pray. They had been doing this for many years. But recently, this gathering was coming into conflict with the worship team. Both groups wanted to be in the same place at the same time, but the noise from one group directly impacted the other group's ability to pray or to practice. So the worship leader asked if the prayer group could use another room to pray since the sanctuary was the only place that they could practice. The prayer group declared emphatically that this was the only place they could pray because this was where they always prayed. The worship leader agreed that the prayer time was important but asked why did they have to pray in this location? He said that he didn't know but 
he couldn't remember a time when there wasn't prayer in the sanctuary part of the service. But, out of curiosity, he asked his grandmother, who had been part of the church when it first started, and she said that they prayed there in the middle of the sanctuary because that's where the heater was. All that to say, sometimes, in all areas of life, but especially the church, we continue to do things that have been done in the past but often don't actually know what the essence of these practices are. So let's go back and look at some of these in the context of the Church of the Nazarene. Let's look at the three Nazarene taboos that I used to define the Nazarene Church at the beginning of the lecture. No drinking, no dancing, no going to the movies. So let's look at these in context of the early history of the Church of the Nazarene. My message is the poverty and despair. The Church of Nazarene has a divinely appointed mission. It's raised up to preach that we are to be sanctified holy in this life and to fulfill that evidence of its possession, the preaching of the gospel to the poor. So what does not going to movies, dancing, or drinking have to do with that? These prohibitions, they make sense in this time period, but more as a social issue than a sin issue. Alcohol in this time period was viewed as an epidemic, and early Nazarenes believed it to be the greatest contributor to poverty, abuse in the home, and the demise of the family. Not to mention it was illegal. This wasn't about not drinking because it's a sin or you'll blow your witness to non-believers. It was simply a boycott of an industry seen as destroying people's lives. Dancing was associated with speakeasies and organized crime, and many of the movies were often shown in the same places as burlesque shows. Remember, this context of the first church of the Nazarene is the Wild West, not going to Applebee's after watching the Avengers at, AM, at an AMC theater. The essence of the behaviors were part of the ministry to the poor more than personal holiness stances that, that it came to be in later generations. Take a look at this topic from a different angle. This symbol is called a radical sign, and when it's applied to a number, it indicates that the root of the number is to be taken, such as a square root. Square root of 9 is 3. And in this case, the cubed root of 8 equals 2. I want to play a little with these math concepts and loosely apply them to our history lesson. What is the historical root of the prayer group in the sanctuary? Was it that the biblical mandate from on high stated that the only place you could pray prior to the service was the center of the sanctuary, or was it that this is where the heat came from and it was the warmest place to pray on a cold winter morning when the heat just came on? Is the historical root of not drinking alcohol a biblical mandate to never drink or an idea that abstaining from alcohol was something that made one holy or was it a social stance against something that was believed to be the leading cause of poverty in the cities where the Nazarenes were ministering? Is the historical square root of not dancing based on an idea that all dancing is sinful, even a father-daughter dance at a wedding, or does it come from a different time era where public dancing often took place in illegal establishments? Is the historical square root of the Church of the Nazarene the do not symbol? Because staying away from all these societal taboos is what keeps a person holy? Or was the root more based in caring for the poor? The practices make sense for that time period, but do they today? Worse, it seems to me that the reason for these prohibitions has been lost through the generations. They've become rules for the sake of rules with little to no attachment to the root reason these practices came to light in the early 1900s. 
And the point of this little history lesson isn't so much to make a case for or against things like drinking or dancing or going to the movies. The point isn't even to figure out where these rules came from, though I, I think that's important. For me, the main point of this exercise is to get us thinking in the direction of this idea. How do we capture the essence, the historical root, of what the early Nazarenes were doing but with practices and prohibitions that make sense with the issues of today in our communities and in our context where we're trying to radically care for misfits? I mentioned at the beginning that in my growing up years, I thought that the Nazarene church was more a place of rules and that holiness was basically not doing anything on the list of do nots. But if someone were to ask me today what I thought the Nazarene church was or aspired to be, I take them to this section of the Covenant of Christian Conduct. So I'm just going to read this to you. I think it beautifully explains what the essence or the historical square root of our church is. The Church of the Nazarene believes this new and holy way of life involves practices to be avoided and redemptive acts of love to be accomplished for the souls, minds, and bodies of our neighbors. One redemptive arena of love involves the special relationship Jesus had and commanded his disciples to have with the poor of this world, that his church ought first to keep itself simple and free from an emphasis on wealth and extravagance, and second, to give itself to the care, feeding, clothing, and sheltering of the poor and marginalized. Throughout the Bible, and in the life and example of Jesus, God identifies with and assists the poor, the oppressed, and those in society who cannot speak for themselves. In the same way, we too are called to identify with and to enter into solidarity with the poor. We hold that compassionate ministry to the poor includes acts of charity, as well as a struggle to provide opportunity, equality, and justice for the poor. We further believe that the Christian's responsibility to the poor is an essential aspect of the life of every believer who seeks a faith that works through love. We believe Christian holiness to be inseparable from ministry to the poor, and that it drives the Christian beyond their own individual perfection and toward the creation of a more just and equitable society and world. Holiness, far from distancing believers from the desperate economic needs of people in this world, motivates us to place our means in the service of alleviating such need and to adjust our wants in accordance with the needs of others. So historically speaking, what is a Nazarene? Nazarene is a radical. Yeah, but so what? Well, being radical specifically about social causes and even more so about caring for the poor, it's in our roots. It's in our DNA. So, what if? What if we could figure out how to take this essence and directly and creatively apply it to our ministry today. How would it look? What would we stand for? What would we stand against? Now often, what happens when we start talking like this is that someone wants to either make this political or wants to accuse me of making this political, and I don't believe either of those are accurate. These ideas are specifically um, and directly what, what I think the church should be doing and what Christians could be doing. If we're talking about what the government needs to be doing, well, there'd be a case that this is a political conversation, and I do believe that those are important too. But in this context, these ideas are all very specifically oriented to what Christians, more specifically Nazarenes, can do to live up to our names as we identify with Jesus the Nazarene. This last section addresses the question, what if? And when we start asking, what if, the answers most often take us out of our comfort zone to the place where the magic happens. Now, sometimes scary places, but necessary nonetheless. We live in a completely different century than Phineas Brzee. Therefore, we have different problems to address, different solutions to create, different stands to make. So the question at hand is, what does a 21st century say about, so we know what they said in 1920, but what should be said and done now? For example, measles, malaria, and diarrhea are the three of the biggest killers of children, yet all are preventable or treatable. What do we say about that? 
HIV and AIDS has created more than 14 million orphans, and 92% of them live in Africa. What does a 21st century Nazarene say about that? Six million children under five die every year as a result of hunger. 134 million children between the ages of 7 and 18 have never been to school. What is a holiness response to that? In the last decade, more than 2 million children have died as a direct result of armed conflict. Two million children are believed to be exploited through the commercial sex trade. Now these are worldwide stats, and some claim there are more in slavery now than in any other time in history. But let's look at this at a local level. Washington, D.C. ranks as having the most human trafficking cases in the United States, and Maryland ranks 13th, and amazingly, Frederick County, because of its location between these two major cities and as a major transportation hub, is one of the hot spots of this evil in the U.S. What does a 21st century Nazarene say about this, especially with it being so prevalent in our own backyard? Most 36 million people live below the poverty line in America, including 12.9 million children. Way back in 2005, that was the first year that people living in poverty in American suburbs outnumbered those in the city. And this stat might come as a surprise, and we often connect poverty with cities. We take mission trips to poor parts of the world or do service projects in poor neighborhoods in the cities, but this question asks, what are we doing about poverty in the suburbs? It looks very different than the stereotypes of poverty that we're used to. Most of us don't need to travel very far or participate in long-distance mission trips to sit with someone barely making it. So the question is, what do our churches say? What are we doing about this? Americans spend a dollar twenty-two for every dollar we make. Now you don't have to be a mathematician or a financial whiz to know that's not going to work for too long. So as Brzee and his peers viewed alcoholism as a major cause for poverty and the breakdown of families, I wonder if in our time era, credit cards and indebtedness in their in the ease of that might be one of the major causes of these problems today. If Brzee were alive. I wonder if this would be what he worked on to abolish and attempt to make a constitutional amendment about. What are our churches saying? What does holiness around indebtedness mean in the year 2021? All that to say, it's a big, big, broad brushstrokes. Just a quick snapshot of global and some local societal problems. But what are our churches doing about these? Are our conversations shaped at all by these issues? Are our ministries attempting to alleviate these in concert with the essence of the Nazarene church? Or do our versions of holiness match with the, the code of conduct that was read? Holiness, far from distancing believers from the desperate economic needs of people in this world, motivates us to place our means in the service of of alleviating such need and to adjust our wants in accordance with the needs of others. What does a 21st century Nazarene say about those things? This section is a tool that I've used often to help people put some hands and feet to the concepts that have just been presented. There's four large categories to filter our ideas through. The first is to provide relief. You've probably heard the saying, if you give a person a fish, they can eat for a day. So there's a need and we seek to fill it. It's as simple as that. Many churches have ministries such as soup kitchens and food pantries and things like that. And this simply involves directly supplying for someone in an urgent need. They need food, we get food. If they need housing, then we get a place to stay. The second category is individual development. And that's the second part of that saying. If we if we give a man a fish, he can eat for a day, but if we teach a person to fish, they can eat for a lifetime. And these would be relational ministries that empower a person to improve physically, emotionally, intellectually, relationally, or in their social status. So those are pretty two pretty common things that happen in a church. And one, what if we did some community development where we gave a person fishing equipment? 
It's great if you've learned how to fish, but if you don't actually have the equipment to go fishing, you're not going to catch too many. So this would be ideas around re renewing building blocks of a healthy community, such as housing, jobs, safety, health, care, and education. So in the first picture, we're giving someone food. The next time we're teaching someone how to cook, where in this one, the person can actually get a job around the idea of making food. One would be structural change. Helping everyone get fair access to the pond. So if someone knows how to fish and now they have equipment, but they aren't allowed at the pool, um, aren't allowed at the pond, I mean, um, it's going to be tough for them to catch fish. And this would be ministries where we're attempting to transform unfair political or economic or educational or environmental or cultural institutions and systems. What if, as a ministry, as a church, we could provide relief, we could provide individual development, we could provide community development, we could provide structural change as an expression of being a holy people who radically care for misfits. At this point, you might be asking yourself, Brian, I agree with your ideas, but where do I start? So the way I like to break these down is through our personal passions. This could fall under two categories, causes or people groups. There's tons of causes, and a great way to sift through them is to pick one that you're most passionate about or one that has directly impacted you the most. Find a group that's already doing something about it and start a group at your church. The, the ideas are endless. So, for example, you might be really passionate about the cause of literacy. The church I was involved with prior to moving to D.C., was located in a city that had one of the worst literacy rates in the country, and this became a huge focus of our ministry. And in regard to people groups, you might love kids, or you might love elderly, or you might be passionate about a particular people group. It doesn't really matter as much as that you just pick one. So let's move on to a tangible example. Uh, I've just picked a random one to give us an idea, so let's go with health care. And let's pick veterans as a special interest group for no other reason than I'm a veteran and let's see what happens. So first up, what if we provided relief for veterans in need of health care? Here's an idea. So this guy is in a veteran's home and he has the health care he needs, but he's lonely. He doesn't have anyone to hang out with. His family is all over the country. And what if we just simply went there and hung out and listened to his stories, told our own stories, played some games, watched a ball game? We're literally just providing relief for a veteran in need of health care, but also just in need of a friend. What if we provided individual development in the context of veterans, in the context of health care? What if we came alongside a group like this? We may or may not have the skills to provide mental health care, but we could do many things to provide support and partnership with a group just like this. Could you picture, even if this isn't your issue or that you're personally connected to, could you picture if a church or even a small group figured out how to walk alongside the men and women who served, but now it's some very negative side effects, and could you support a support team to help them work through the transition instead of doing it by themselves. That may not be a powerful expression of the love of God in the lives of these men and women. What if we provided community development for veterans? The next, the next thing is a commercial that has deeply impacted me. I wish this was a commercial of a church.
Ironically, it appears that a beer company has captured the essence of the Nazarene church more than most Nazarene churches. This last area in the what if tool is structural change or advocacy. Again, this section can feel very political, and in some cases it might be, but weren't the early Nazarenes involved in this type of work at the beginning of our history? This could be an example of structural change. I'm not trying to sell this particular group. In fact, I don't even know much about it. Um, but just giving an example of the types of things we could add our voice to. There are thousands of these groups that address every topic under the sun. Yet most churches and most Christians as individuals are silent. Where can we add our voice to help those in our neighborhood who most people don't even see or hear? And what if we did? That is a lot to process, tons of information. But this could be a helpful tool to use in your ministry, or at the very least uh, on your final project coming up next week uh, for this particular class. So I love this quote, and I believe that it summarizes the idea I'm trying to get across for us Nazarenes. We can, and in many cases, need to drastically change our methods, but at the same time, we need to stay very close to the essence of why we're called Nazarenes in the first place. As the methods, there may be a million, and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. So what if we radically cared for misfits? So telling of the mission statement of the Mid-Atlantic District Church of the Nazarene, we are compelled by God. We are a movement of misfit radicals who passionately live the story of Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening. Here are the questions for this lecture that we'll be discussing in our next meeting together.